Today we are gonna be talking about commercial real estate and we're gonna be talking about the four major food groups, the retail, industrial, multi-res, and office space. So, without further ado, let's get into it. Hey everybody, this is Jesse Vergali coming at you from Bigger Pockets, uh, your favorite Canadian contributor. Also, your only Canadian contributor. First of all, I wanna say thanks to Brandon and Josh. I just received my copy of this book. If you guys don't have it, I recommend taking a look. And uh, if you do have it, uh, some uh, really interesting stuff happening on page 58 there. Anyways, let's get into it. Okay, we're gonna start with multifamily, also known as multi-residential, also known as apartment buildings. Now, this is one of the ways that most people break out of single family, not that there's anything wrong with single family, and get into the commercial real estate space. It's certainly the way that I did it. One of the benefits with this is it's just consistent. Everybody needs a place to live, and your risk is somewhat limited. Certain aspects of commercial real estate, you can have very high vacancies. Apartments, not that it can't happen, it's just very rare to have an apartment that is you know, 50% vacant. Another big benefit with these is sweet turnover. My partner John and I, when we turn over a suite, that means when somebody moves out and a new person comes in, most of the time we don't have to do a lot of work. If it's really old, we'll do construction and we might uh, put $10,000 or $15,000, depend depending on the market you're in, in work into the space. Uh, but most of the time, if it's just tenant to tenant, carpet, paint, usually is, uh, is all you need. Another benefit to this is if you're trying to break out of single family and you've shown a bit of a track record, it might be a little bit easier to get into multi-residential. It is still considered a commercial asset though, so some of the requirements will be uh, more intense than you know you, buying your average home. One area that I got involved in that's kind of a subsection uh, or a subgroup of multi-residential and that's student housing. I got into student housing, that was my first uh, purchase into or first foray into real estate investing. This area is a little bit different in the sense that you could have an apartment building in a student area, but some of the fundamentals and the way you look at that investment will be different. So. For instance, you would look at the universities that you have. Luckily for me, when I invested, we had three different universities in the area, quite a few students, so there was no issue filling those uh, spaces. Now, I know some of you are thinking, oh my God, the students, they'll just tear the place apart. Is it true? Is it not true? The answer to both is kinda. It, it, um, some students will be great, some students will be more of a headache. Although a lot of uh, the product that's being built in these areas now are being built in somewhat of a bulletproof fashion. A lot of now condo developments are coming around student housing. It's really a shell uh, that uh, you really can't do that much damage to. That being said, one trick that I always used was that when I did have multi multiple students living in one space, I make sure there's some guys and some girls. There's something about all women being in one space or all men in being one space that it kind of devolves. When you have the two balanced, eh, people, I don't know, seem to, you know. On to the next one. Now this is what I do for a living. I'm actually a commercial real estate broker. I work in the office space. Office is one of my favorite areas of real estate. It's just a very interesting class. Think about it this way. In some of the most simplest terms, once somebody told me that office property is kind of like a bond, it started to click for me because the valuation of real estate, of any real estate, is the cash flows that are coming into that building. And for office, those cash flows, in theory, can be more consistent. Usually, if you're in the core, uh, the tenants are very good balance sheet tenants. And oftentimes, I'm actually going through this situation right now, we just did a deal where we put a user in an office that the landlord didn't feel had the uh, balance sheet that he wanted, so it, he didn't decline the tenant, but he also asked for a lot more uh, in prepaid rent and uh, security deposit. So think about it in the way that you're buying balance sheets of companies and you're buying the cash flows of those companies. Now the other thing that's really cool about Office is like most real estate, it's somewhat of an inflation hedge because typically in Office, what you have is step ups in the rent. So one year you'll be paying, for instance, $25 net per square foot per year, and then the next year you're paying 27, the next year you're paying 29. So built into a lot of these leases, and that's why due diligence is so important, is these increases in rent, which is, again, your inflation hedge. Now, the thing with office that is also a pro 
is that it, they have something called triple net leases. Now, I will, maybe we'll get into that in another video. What that basically means is that the tenant is responsible for all the costs, the net rent, the taxes, the maintenance, the insurance. They pay everything. The landlord basically just picks up a check. The downside with office. Now, the capital requirements in office are quite high. And this isn't just to buy the place, this is actually to turn over the suites or units themselves. Now, what I mean by that, remember in apartment buildings, you know, you didn't need much money when you go from John to Phil, when one moves out and one moves in. Now, in office, it's a different animal. If you have a 100,000 square foot office tenant, and after three years, they leave your space, and they left a beautiful build out, and it cost an arm and a leg, and oftentimes it's the landlords that will subsidize the cost to build the space out, or build it out themselves. Now what? Now you may be thinking, oh, well, it's beautiful space, the leasehold improvements are great, the new tenant's gonna want it. However, that's 99% of the time not the case because if you have a group that say is a law firm, they come in, they have multiple offices, limited breakout space, limited open areas, and all of a sudden you have the new cool tech company that moves in and wants to rip it all out. And by ripping it all out, the landlord again will have to oftentimes build up the space themselves or at least offer a tenant allowance. Now, the caveat with that is it's very dependent on your market. In Toronto, in Canada, we are very similar to Manhattan right now in San Francisco where it's a very landlord heavy market, but still those inducements need to be accounted for. The other component of that is if the landlord doesn't offer to build out the space or doesn't give you what's called a tenant allowance, then oftentimes that will be reflected in the net rents that the tenant pays. And what that means is they'll be lower. And if the net rents are lower, that means the NOI is lower. And you all know if the NOI is lower, building value drops. It's really awesome. You can make a lot of money when, when it comes to cycles in the market. I'm sure in you know, 07, 08, 09, where people were buying in the lower end, and sold later, there was, uh, there was a lot of money to be made. Just keep in mind, it is uh, one of the riskier asset class and does take deep pockets. Okay, industrial. Industrial is, uh, is the everyman of commercial real estate, in my opinion. Industrial is a great asset class. Some of the pros of industrial is, unlike office, the capital requirements are actually quite low. Oftentimes it's, it's a concrete pad with four walls and a ceiling. And you really don't have to do too much. And oftentimes the tenants that you do have, they don't really want too much done. Uh, that sometimes they do, but most often they don't. Think about your distribution centers, your warehouses. This area in uh, the market, both in the US and Canada, is extremely frothy. And what I mean by that is everybody wants to get into industrial and it, it's extremely, extremely competitive right now. And that, you know, you could argue is, is a function of uh, the Amazon effect and what's going on in e-commerce today. Some of the drawbacks to industrial really comes down to the fact that industrial can go from 100% occupied to 0% occupied real quick. Oftentimes these are single tenant industrial spaces. Now you could have industrial spaces that have multi-tenants, it is possible, but even at that, you might have three, four tenants. Again, you lose one or two tenants, you go from 100% to 50% vacancy, that's a pretty big hit. I, in contrast to multi-residential uh, and apartment buildings, you know, you might get to 10%, 15%, you're not gonna lose half of your of your tenants all in one shot. Industrial, that's not the case. So I would say industrial to think of it kind of in between office and multi-family. And now I should mention, all of these are gonna be under the umbrella of, you could have very opportunistic, risky products and very safe products in all of these asset classes. There is a spectrum, but for each individual one, I'm speaking relatively generally. Okay, retail. Retail is the wild, wild west when it comes to commercial real estate. No one type of retail is the same as another. And retail, you can have, you know, grocery anchored retail, you could have strip plazas, you could have malls, promenade. Now, everybody's basically saying, or you've heard everybody say, retail is dead. And that is you know, debatable, but it's gonna be true for certain types of retail and not necessarily true for others. For instance, what we're seeing in Canada is that we have a very, very different amount of retail than the US. So PwC did a study where I think per capita in the United States, there's 24 square feet of retail commercial space uh, to, per person. 
to Canada, I think it's around 11, and then the UK, I believe, is like four. So what that means is that a lot of the retail on the high end, your promenade malls, your, your high end retail is doing okay. And your lower, lower end retail, think of dollar stores, Walmarts, is also doing okay. It's this middle ground that you're seeing that are kind of dying. It's, you know, the, the nail salons, the strip malls, the plazas. And I think we're seeing that a lot in the United States and we're certainly seeing it to a, to a less extent here in Canada. So I won't give up on it just yet. Now, one of the positive things with retail is oftentimes, as I mentioned before, you will have a triple net tenant. Uh, so if you can have a tenant that has good credit worthiness and is a solid, uh, a solid tenant and can be a solid anchor, uh, you know, like a Starbucks or something, you know, then you it can have a, quite a good investment over a long period of time. Now, when it comes to grocery anchored real estate, same thing applies here. You just wanna be careful for those strip plazas or those one-offs, nail salons, uh, dry cleaning. That's what we're starting to see getting squeezed right now when it comes to retail. Now, the thing to think about retail as well is it's pretty much build to suit. What I mean by that is the actual build out of the space is usually particular to that type of tenant. Now, it's just something to think about when you do bring it back to base building, which is kind of your concrete shell. Now, I'd be remiss to not talk about cannabis for a little bit. We're seeing a crazy amount of retail users trying to get their storefronts. For some context, I'm not as familiar with the states, but I believe Washington and Colorado are somewhat similar. Out west in Canada, and where I live in Toronto, we are now looking towards, I think, April 2019, if memory serves me, as a legalization for retail operations for cannabis. So these are dispensaries that will be able to uh, provide clients in areas in Toronto and there will be a limit to how many that they're actually allowed uh, but what we're finding is that there's a big delta between what tenants in the market would normally pay and what these cannabis users are paying so just something to keep on your radar it's a it's an interesting area that's pretty much a hot topic right now in uh, in retail uh, commercial space now one thing I know I didn't mention is hoteling. Uh, now hotels are not my area of expertise and it's kind of a mashup of a real estate investment as well as an operating business. So it's a little bit different. I would definitely defer to somebody that has more, area, more expertise in that area to give a fuller picture on that. Okay, Bigger Pockets family, thanks so much for watching. If you found this helpful, why don't you go ahead and give a thumbs up, subscribe, and leave a comment. If there's anything I covered that you want me to go into more depth on, I'd be happy to do another video. Just let me know. Cheers.